Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Rochin. And my name is Lau Cabral, and today we're going to be presenting the Phoenix Metrics Processor. And the reason why we chose this name is because we found a pretty cool logo online, and we were based on that. Okay, so, so first, this is an outline of what we'll be talking about today. So first we're going to go through the basics of the uh, MIPS processor, followed by a schematic of the Phoenix uh, CPU, then a more in-detailed uh, design and uh, implementation of uh, the components inside of the CPU, and then finally we'll go into enhancements and future enhancements. Uh, we'll be talking about these uh, later on in the, in the presentation. So first we're going to be talking about the MIPS overview. This is a general MIPS overview. It's a 32-bit architecture. It's a hardware memory architecture, and the only way we can access uh, the memory, uh, the data inside the memory, is by using loads and store instructions. It's uh, 4K by 8-bit registers, and it's actually, we're only going to use 1K because uh, it's a 32-bit register, which takes up four bytes in memory. Uh, the data types we're going to be using are uh, unsigned and signed integers. And it also has three uh, different uh, instruction types, which are R, I, and J. Okay. Uh, so for the R type, we'll be, uh, we have a 6-bit opcode. Uh, basically, in the decode state, if this is 0, then it will determine that it's an R type instruction. And for the R type, we have two source registers. We have the RS, the RT, and we have a destination register, RD. We also have a 5-bit shift amount and a 6-bit uh, function select. Moving on to I type, we have a 6-bit opcode, uh, RS regis uh, source register, um, RT destination register, and 16-bit immediate value. We also have a J-type, which is just a 6-bit opcode with a 26 address. Next, we're going to be talking about the memory bus controller. So this is the overview of what it looks like. On the top left, we have the uh, PN, uh, PN CPU. On the right-hand side, we have the memory modules. And the way the CPU is going to be interfacing with the memory modules is through this memory bus for uh, storing and reading uh, information between the uh, CPU and the uh, memory modules. So what do, you, what do you mean by memory bus controller? Uh, the memory bus controller here is how we're going to be uh, transferring data between uh, the registers of the CPU and uh, data memory by using storage and loads or inputs and outputs. So, so it's not a separate module? Uh, it is a separate module. So what, uh, since they are outside of the CPU, uh, we decided to make a small controller for uh, when the CPU is talking to either data memory or IO memory. So whenever you're writing or uh, reading from those modules, then uh, based on the signals from the control unit, then it can decipher what to pass over or, or send over to the memory modules. But we don't see that module in uh, this no, diagram. No, we do not. You're no. just calling it memory uh, bus controller. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So that's actually inside of the CPU, the top level. Okay. Yeah. So next we're going to be talking about the Phoenix uh, MIPS uh, schematic. So this is more in-depth uh, in uh, diagram from the previous slides. So this is going uh, to show uh, the, how uh, complex the CPU is. And the data memory modules are on the right-hand side again. So first we'll be talking about the CPU, and uh, uh, this is kind of a poor image because it doesn't show all three, but the CPU is comprised of the integer data path, the instruction unit, and the and, uh, uh, control unit. So first we'll be talking about the integer data path, and basically the integer data path stores a, uh, has a register file, which is uh, 32 registers, uh, all of them 32-bit uh, uh, 32 bit in length. The key ones that you will have to know is register 0. Register 0 is hardwired to 0, 32 bit 0. Uh, register 29, which is your stack pointer, and register uh, 31, which is your RA register. Next, we'll be talking about the instruction unit. The instruction unit is pretty much what handles the fetch state um, of the CPU, in which case, first, you start off with a PC select, which determines whether or not, uh, well, actually, it just passes the value of branch jump PCN or 32-bit uh, zero, and then that's stored into PC uh, register. And then PC register is used as the address for uh, the instruction uh, memory. So once we uh, load from the instruction memory, that is stored into the instruction register, and then that's the one that will be used for the control unit. Yeah, I see that you have a backup. Sorry. You have a uh, PC or like a instruction memory write signal coming from your control unit? Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, Do you because ever use that? Use, because we use the same architecture as a, as a basic uh, data modules that we use, that we made, uh, we'll be talking about it later in the, in the slides, uh, those are actually just uh, hardwired zero. Because we're, we're, uh, with the instruction memory, we're never actually writing to it. So, so we're only reading from okay. the instruction memory. Good. So next we're going to be talking about the control unit and the Phoenix CPU. 
So what is control unit? It's the brains of the processor. It generates all the control signals associated with the internals of the processor. And it's a state machine architecture. Um, right, in the next slide, I know it's really hard to see, but we have about 90 states in the uh, control unit. And now we can talk about the memory part of the, uh, of the MIPS. Okay, so we have four uh, different uh, memory blocks here. We have the register file right here, the instruction memory, as we have already talked about, the data memory, and the I.O. memory. Uh, with the register file, uh, I'm just going to go into a quick overview. It's just uh, 32 in length by 32 bit wide. Um, it is used for source and uh, writing in the, inside of the integer data path. Um, and next we can talk about the test bench, the verification of using the, the CPU registers of reading and writing, I mean, uh, writing to the registers. So this is a simple program uh, we, uh, John and I made. So what it's doing is just doing Louis Ori's, Louis Ori's for registers zero to three. And uh, you can see that we are writing to register zero, uh, zero to three, but we're not writing to register zero because it's a, uh, you cannot overwrite uh, register zero. It's hard coded to zero value. And just as a quick side note, uh, the, when he says Louis Ori, you're actually doing a loading median, so you're, you're storing 32 bit into that register. Um, the next, we'll be talking about the instruction memory. Uh, it, it is a 4K by 8, uh, or 1K by 32 bit, as you would like to say. Um, um, we, we use big game format. Uh, the address coming in is a 12 bit address uh, signal, and uh, we only read from it, as mentioned. We don't write to it. And then here's just a little display of uh, how big in the goes. Uh, the most significant byte goes out to the least significant byte. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much how it's, uh, the data is transferred. So now here's a, a Verilog uh, verification test bench of what John just explained, but using the Verilog code. So here we're going to be using Louis Ori's again, but for registers uh, 0 to 2. And what we're doing here is we're going to be uh, we're just going to be looking at the instruction uh, data right here and seeing if it's actually being stored in big Indian format. And this is the uh, instruction memory right here. So you can see that 3C01234 uh, is actually correlated to memory 01, which it's, means it's actually stored properly. OK, and the next one is uh, uh, data memory. It's pretty much the same as the instruction memory, except it's, you can think of it as an expansion to the CPU uh, as far as memory. You can uh, read and write to it. Uh, using load word and store word. Um, and then this is just a, a display showing uh, how the, instruct, the load word instructions go and how it will calculate the effective address. So basically, you load the contents of register R15 and you add it to the median value, and that will be your effective address for uh, load word or store word. Uh, yeah. So now here's another uh, ver uh, verification test bench here. Uh, we wrote another simple program just using what's different about this one is we're using load words and store word instructions. Um, so what you can see here is that the load word, we're calculating the effective address, and we did that by taking the contents of register 15 and adding, adding it with the MIDI field, which comes out to be zero. So we're looking at memory, uh, the memory address zero, which is C3, 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 and storing it into register 17, and we can see that it, it's actually being stored. And for the, uh, I mean loaded, and then for the store word, we are going to store register one into a register, uh, so, uh, the, the field of uh, the contents of register 14 plus 0, which comes up to be memory address 4, and uh, register 1 has this data uh, value, and it's being stored in the proper uh, memory uh, location. Okay, and the IO memory, this is uh, where it actually gets uh, somewhat different. Here, uh, where actually, the IO memory actually takes in, uh, in a, an external device interrupt. So in this case, it comes from the test bench. So it takes that signal, that interrupt signal as an input, and generates an actual, uh, it generates its own extra uh, output interrupt. That goes to the CPU to let it know that a device is trying to communicate. And it also takes the, an, an acknowledgement. So when the CPU does, acknowledge, uh, does see that the device is trying to communicate, it outputs an interrupt acknowledge, and, it, uh, and the, and the IO memory uh, deasserts uh, interrupt. So the way we uh, verify this is by using the inputs and output instructions in the uh, test bench. So what we can see here is just like before, the output is uh, we are going to store that into the uh, I.O. memory. So the first thing it does, it grabs, uh, it gets the contents of register 17 and stores it in uh, 0 plus the contents of uh, register 16. Well, register 16 has a value of 0, 0, so it stores this value into uh, memory uh, 
memory of address zero. And then we're going to input it, which means we're going to take this value and put it inside the CPU register, which is register 19. And that's exactly what our instructions is doing. So that means our input outputs are verified. Yeah, and you can think of input output as like lower so or temporal memory. Okay, and then uh, that takes us to interrupt. So as I said, uh, an external device uh, sends out a, sorry, as an external device sends out an inter uh, uh, inputs an interrupt signal, the IO memory generates an interrupt signal, and then that goes back to the CPU, and then once the CPU finishes an instruction that is currently executing, then it'll go into an interrupt state, in which it'll first uh, load up the stack pointer from register 29, increments it, so it's a free ink, and then uh, pushes a PC address onto the stack, so you can see how uh, initially with the 3FC, it goes to 400 and stores PC address. Then it will increment again and store the status flag register. And uh, and then from there it will jump, it will uh, load up the memory contents of 3FC from DMAM and jump into the ISR. So uh, that leads me to the stat our flags uh, slide. But we just uh, just a quick overview. Uh, so our status flag register is a loadable register, and the reason why we made it a loadable register is because. When, if, when instructions are being executed, like let's say an add or subtract, then we want the ALU uh, flags to be stored. Uh, but when we're in an interrupt state, we, wanna, we do not want to load the, the flags onto the SF register, because then that will be overriding the previous uh, instructions flags. So that's what we want with that. And then we have a MUNS, because zero is taking uh, the values from ALU, and then one is taking the values from the DMAM. So when you actually pop the status flags from the stack, you want to store them back into the SF register. Well, we got to stop right there for a second. Uh, yeah. What happens if I'm in an interrupt service routine and I want to do a branch not equal or a, you know, a jump on the carry? Or, so you're saying you can't write the status flags in an interrupt service routine? Because in the interrupt service routine, can't oh, no, no, just, uh, do conditional while instructions. Oh, no, that's just while it's... Uh, while it's in the in the state of uh, pushing the your uh, your PC and uh, okay and yeah no that's the only time okay yeah. once it once it when, when it's in those states it's deasserted once it goes into the ISR it's asserted again good. sorry good. about that no trouble yeah good question so next we're gonna be talking about return from interrupt so what return from interrupt does it's gonna pop the PC and status flag from the stack and we're gonna be uh, popping at location 404 in the data memory because that's where uh, the stack pointer was, uh, or is. And then we're gonna jump to the new PC, which is where, uh, where we got interrupted. And another thing about this is post decrementing. So now here's a test bench of verification of the in, uh, interrupt and return from interrupt. So this is our, uh, our main program here. As you can see, there is no uh, interrupt, uh, we're not, we're setting up interrupt first, and then we're, um, the way we're getting a signal from interrupt is through the test bench. After 300 time units, I know it's really hard to see, but we enabled the interrupt signal down here. And in the test bench, you can see that we get interrupted at the fourth instruction, and after the fourth instruction, we do the ISR. And then the last instruction we do in the ISR is return from interrupt, and we pick up the pace from where we left. And what's it interesting to see here is that you can see the PC changing throughout the program. So you can see the uh, PC changed from 16 to 512, and then back to 20 after it's done from the interrupt. Okay, uh, next will be our enhancements. So uh, we decided to go with, uh, uh, kind of follow uh, the archive instru uh, inst uh, instruction uh, setup, where we have a uh, opcode, but in this case, our opcode has to be 1F. So if during the decode state, if it reads uh, 1F, one, uh, one in the 31 to 26, then it knows it's an enhancement, and then we'll uh, go into the enhancement uh, instructions. And then we have two source registers, RS, RT. We have a destination uh, register, RD, uh, shift amount, and uh, six bit uh, function select. The first uh, instruction we'll be talking about will be a NOFX. Uh, NOFX basically generates a, a, a variable delay, if you can think about it. And the reason why we wanted to implement this is because uh, from past classes where we were using uh, assembly, we were having to constantly loop uh, no ops to generate a particular delay, usually because we were interfacing with hardware and stuff like that. So we were like, okay, well, why don't we make a variable no op delay? And uh, and this uh, for this, what it does is it grabs the shift amount and sends it to the so the the, the CPU actually acquires the shift amount from the IR instruction and it loops it, it loops it decrement loops 
until it reaches zero. So that's how, so it basically stays in a loop where like, okay, uh, is it, a, if it's a greater than one, it, is, if it is, then just go back to this current state of like do nothing, where all the flags are deasserted. I mean, not all the flags, control work is deasserted. What does delay R and RS mean, RD and RS? What's that mean? So that's our uh, instruction, uh, that's our media field of how many uh, times you want to do the no off. He just said the shift yeah, amount. Yeah, uh, no, sorry, that's, that's Which he's way correct. is it? He's correct. Yeah, that's where you put the, the ship, the, the, the media field. Yeah, he expanded the... Uh, where? The RD? RS? Or... Oh, uh, yeah, we're not using the, the shift amount field in this case. What uh, are you using? The RD and RS because we wanted a bigger uh, field for yeah. it. He just expanded the number yeah, of... Yeah, I just expanded the number. Use for this. So up to 10 bits. Up to yeah. 10 bits. The media value. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what Okay. Sorry about that. So now here's uh, we're uh, doing the test mention of the NOAP X. Uh, X is just a placeholder. It can actually mean a number, uh, NOAP one. So here in the first uh, the first test bench, we're doing no NOAP uh, operation, and it, fin and it finished within uh, 970 nanoseconds. And a note here is that we're using a 50 megahertz clock, which takes up 20 nanoseconds. And in the second uh, uh, test bench, we use NOAP two, which is going to take up two clock cycles. And what you can see here is the time finish took a little bit longer. And this is the NOAP 8, which took a lot longer than NOAP 2. And then up here we have NOAP 10, which took much longer than all two of these. Which means that our NOAP is actually being delayed properly. You don't show us any machine code, though, of how the NOAP 10, for example, is encoded? Uh, yeah, we have it right here, the uh, instruction right here. Oh, well, that's just, what's the value that you're NOAPing there? Uh, well, this one's just for, uh, this is just an example for the first one. Show uh, zero. Yeah. 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 So yeah. we don't have the machine code for these two, but we have it for this one because they couldn't fit in this slide. So we just put for one for one example. Okay. Okay. The next would be the swap instruction. So basically, what we're doing is we're loading up register of RS and register of RT, and we're going to be swapping them. Uh, uh, okay. So now what John said is we're going to be swapping two registers, and the way we're going to be swapping it is by uh, using a uh, is by uh, RS and RT, yeah. So, so this is an example we have here. We're uh, we're loading up uh, contents and registers one through four, and then we're going to be swapping one with two, and then three with four. Uh, this is the machine code right here, the instruction, and you can see that uh, right here, register one and two were actually swapped from the original content, and then three and four were swapped successfully as well. Okay, and then for the test bench, we're going to implement this. What we did is. We expanded our DA select. So what we decided to do is uh, we needed to add the RS field going into the D address. And the reason why is because uh, the way that we ended up, the logic behind uh, the swap is uh, you load um, a register of RS onto, uh, onto S, register of RT onto T, and then you pass S and then store it back into our uh, register of RT, and then you pass T and store it into register of RS, hence why we needed the RS field right there. Don't have the RTL for that to show us the states, huh? Uh, no. Yeah, that would have been useful. Okay, yeah. I figured if I... Uh, next, we'll be moving on to uh, add three registers. So basically, we uh, use RD as a source and destination. So what we're doing is we're loading up register of RS, register of RT, adding them, storing it back to register RS, and then we load up again register of RS, which has S plus C, we load up T with register of RD, and then add those up, and then store it back into register RD. And another, another note uh, from uh, John's slide is that we're using sign addition, and it's not unsigned. Okay. So for the add three uh, registers, here's the machine code over here. I, I know it's a little hard to see, but uh, so what we're doing is we're going to add up the first three registers, uh, registers one through three, and we loaded up uh, the registers one and three with uh, one, two, and three. So, uh, yeah. And so then uh, the first thing we do is we add up the first two uh, registers, which is uh, 1 and 2. It comes out to be 3 and stored in R1 because that's the, uh, we made that our destination. And then from there, we're going to add up uh, the, the result of R1 and R2 plus 3, which comes out to be 3. So it's 1 plus 2 plus 3, which equals 6, which our add 3 is working correctly. And uh, this is basically, uh, for this one, it's for the application of add three, we basically did the same thing. We uh, didn't have to really make any differences because Swap had already made it for us. Here's a kind of like the RTL. I, I made it a little bit different. Maybe I should have stayed to the to the standards of uh, what the RTL. But it's pretty much what I uh, summarized verbally when I introduced R three. 
And then where am I? Uh, we were looking online to see what type of instructions we should have, and where am I was one that kept popping up. So where am I uh, basically uh, uh, stores uh, uh, the current PC of the, of the instruction well, that we're currently uh, executing, and stores it into the uh, ID field. And so the way that yes. that's done is, uh, actually, I'll, I'll explain that out in a little bit. All right, so this is the uh, uh, test bench verification of where am I. So in where am I, we are going to store the PC into uh, register R1, because that's where we specify where we want the PC to go in. So up here, you can notice that the PCs are being incremented. And right before we call where am I, the PC was 24. So also keep in mind that this PC is decimal value, is a decimal format. And uh, the values inside the registers are hexadecimal. So 24 and 18 are uh, the same. So that means our where am I is working uh, properly. So this is the uh, control path of the where am I. The first thing we do is we load up the uh, PC into the YMUX down here. And then from the YMUX, we store it back to the uh, register file. And then from the register file, we go through the uh, execution state, which is uh, the LU, and we subtract 4. And then we go back to the LU and store it back in to uh, get the PC out. And we actually have to add a, a decrement for T because uh, we didn't actually have that instruction. We had it for S. So that was one of the other things we had to add for where am I. So next is the disable interrupt. What the disable interrupt does, it disables the interrupt if, it's, if it was ever set up. So from the previous uh, example we did for the interrupt, we uh, <coughs> we loaded, uh, we, we asserted the interrupt enable flag, and then we deasserted group uh, quickly. Uh, this is the same uh, interrupt signal that we uh, gave it before. Uh, after 300 time units, we're going to assert it. But the difference here is that once we disable the interrupt, we're not going through the ISR anymore. So that means, uh, we're not doing the ISR instructions. We're just going straight through without doing the ISR. Well, so, uh, go back. Explain that again. Uh, the disable interrupt? Yeah. So what we're doing here I, is... I'm, I know what disable yeah. interrupt. It just turns off the bit. Yeah, it turns off the bit. Okay, then, so... So... Did um, you disable it in the interrupt service routine or, or before you got to the interrupt yeah, service no, routine? Yeah, before we got to yeah, the interrupt. Yeah, you see here the second yeah, instruction. Yeah, the second instruction, we uh, disabled it. Yeah. So, so we set it up and disabled it to see that it's not going to go to the ISR. Okay, and then the next, next one is a uh, square. So basically, uh, now it's kind of like uh, inverse. Uh, RD is actually using as a, is being used as a source. So both uh, T register and S uh, register are being uh, loaded up with a register of RD. And then the, we uh, execute the multiply uh, instruction, and we store high into RS and, uh, and low into RT. Um, so now here's the uh, square verification. And what we're doing here is we're loading up uh, hex value 08 into register 1. So you can see register 1 has a uh, 08. And then the second instruction we call is the square. And what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to place the uh, the upper part of the square uh, value into register 2 and the lower part into register 3. And you can see that the square of 8 is 40 hex or 8 hex is 40 hex and you can see that 2 and 3 do have values instead of uh, hexes. So that means our square is coming out correctly. So did you try it with some realistic values that would fill both registers? Uh, yes, I did. But I just did it. I just did this for simplicity. Illustration. Yeah. So you guys know, oh, it's a square because if it fills up more, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. And for our future enhancements, uh, our push and pop were more uh, specific or catered more towards our interrupt. So we would like to uh, add a general uh, push and pop where we uh, grab the contents of our S and store it to the top of the stack. And then uh, vice versa, Pop will be grabbing the, the top of the stack and storing into RA, as well as uh, adding pipelines. All right, thank you guys. Do you have any questions? No, I've got out of time. Good job.